Well, good morning. Welcome to worship this morning on the first Sunday in Advent. It's also our Hanging of the Greens uh, service, so I I hope that you came uh, ready to uh, be in a festive mood, having had Thanksgiving this past week, and as we begin Advent, I am really excited about it, and um, hope this will be a, a time of blessing for you and for your family. I want to welcome those who are joining us online. We are glad that you are here. You will notice this week that there are a few different camera angles that you will be experiencing. Uh, With that said, uh, we do ask you to be patient with us if for some reason we're stuck on a random chandelier or or a poinsettia or something like that. Uh, do know that the, the uh, team is getting used to the, um, to the new software and, and everything. And so, uh, but this, we, we hope um, in the days ahead and, and as we worship and uh, develop our online presence, that this will be a, a blessing to those who are able to join us online and that you will have more of a, of a feel that you are here with us um, as we worship um, because you are part of this, uh, of this service and of this experience. Um, I'd like to welcome those who are visiting us as well, whether you're visiting us in person or visiting us online. If you're visiting in person, do notice that a a portion of the bulletin does tear out. You can use that to leave contact information here at the church, and we will be glad to follow up with you. Um, You can place those in the offering plates following the service. If you're joining us online, you can go to firstbaptistfarmville.org. You can uh, look for information there to uh, contact us, and we would love to follow up with, with you and see how we can uh, minister to you and your family. Uh, This morning, for giving of tithes and offerings, you can do so by placing in the offering plates, again, on the stage and in the vestibule, um, or you can give online at firstbaptistfarmville.org, or you can mail or drop off uh, to the office during the week. Um, You will notice, as far as the schedule goes and announcements, that this coming Wednesday we are back on. I don't know about you, but I miss seeing your faces this past Wednesday, and so... Uh, we look forward, though, to, to having Wednesday evenings back. If you're going to join us, um, 
uh, it, it, please remember you need to let us know in the office uh, by noon um, on Mondays. Uh, just, you know, if there's any change in your reservation, if you're one who's a long standing, you know, you won't have to do that. But if you're one who goes week to week, just remember, because um, we took last week off, uh, that please let us know in the office. So we'll make sure we'll have um, en- enough meals and such. The children also are going to be having practice for Christmas music this coming Wednesday at 6.30 p.m., and so Catherine asked me to make sure uh, you, you are aware of that. Um, the, they're going to be singing with our Christmas cantata on uh, December the 18th, uh, which is going to be a really special day. Please mark that on your calendars. Um, in the next few weeks, we'll be giving a little more details on that, but it's going to be a bit, very special time uh, of worship on the 18th. Um, next Sunday, we do have the church conference at 5 p.m., in the afternoon, and we'll remind you, of course, next week as well. But uh, do note that you can grab some uh, uh, copies of the 2023 proposed budget that are over here to my left, your right. Um, if you did not get one through email or get one mailed to you, um, please do refer to that. And if you have any questions, you can reach out to those who are serving on trustees for clarification. Uh, the the sign-up sheet is also over here for the Mike's Farm trip that is on December the 10th. And um, the details for that are that the cost is $22 per person for ages 5 and older. I also want to um, ask you this morning to uh, remember Harriet Satterthwaite in your prayers. Um, she went to the hospital, I believe it was late Friday evening, and um, they still don't know exactly what's going on, uh, but they're, uh, uh, they're treating her and, and running tests and such, but uh, Lisa and Martha have been in contact with me and um, they have asked for prayers, uh, of course, for Harriet, and um, uh, during, during this, hopefully she can return home soon, and it's nothing serious uh, going on, but we uh, do keep her in our prayers today. So um, with that said, please join your hearts with me in prayer as we begin this time of worship. Father, we thank you so much for the ways that you have uh, been, with us, been with us this past week. We thank you for the experiences that we've had with family and friends as we have Uh, gathered around tables to give thanks. Uh, We thank you that that you're always with us and that as we take time to give thanks to you, uh, you you really uh, realign our our minds and our hearts and and put us into the position you you want us to be. God, we pray that as we worship you today, as we begin uh, our our church calendar year today uh, with the beginning of Advent, we pray that um, you would richly bless us as we uh, we seek you this morning and that you would... um, Get us ready for this season to, to enjoy all of the wonderful experiences that we'll have. In Jesus' holy name we pray. Amen. which is kind of putting the end in sight for us. Um, So he is doing very well. Um, He was awake and alert most of the day yesterday, even after his surgery, Um, joking around, laughing. Granted, he can't speak, so trying to mouth words at us, but he is um, frustrated but in good spirits at the same time. Um, So keep prayers. They are absolutely working. We had a really good week, Um, so we're hoping this week is another repeat and that we'll be able to go to uh, rehab fairly soon. We do have another prayer request on top of that though. His mother fell on Thursday at um, her sister's house and has broken her hip. (laughs) Um, So she is in the hospital um, at Wake Med and with um, having to have PT herself. No surgery, so but, and it's a simple break, but she has to do PT. So now it's a race between the two of them as to who can get out first. (laughs) So keep them both in your prayers, but um, Prayers are absolutely working and wonderful, and God is amazing and loves all of us, so we can definitely feel that. So thank you for praying and keep it up. Now, for our call to worship, if you will follow along in your bulletin with me, I'll be reading the um, non-highlighted parts if you will follow with the bold. How shall we prepare this house for the coming of the king? With branches of cedar, the tree of royalty. How should we prepare this house for the coming of the eternal Christ? With garlands of pine and fir, whose leaves are living evergreen. How shall we prepare this house for the coming of our Savior? With reeds of holly and ivy, telling of his passion, death, and resurrection. 
How shall we prepare our hearts for the coming of the Son of God? By hearing again the words of scriptures, foretelling the saving work of God. For God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but the world through him might be saved. Glory to God in the highest. The first Sunday of Advent gives us the opportunity to center our hearts and minds on hope. It is a beautiful chance to remember the hope God offers to the whole world. It is the hope that he has given us through sending his son, Jesus. In Galatians chapter 4, verse 4 through 8, Paul writes, But when the set time had fully come, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those under the law, that we might receive adoption to sonship. Because you are his sons, God sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, the spirit who calls out, Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave, but God's child. And since you are his child, God has made you also an heir. In these verses, Paul articulates so perfectly the great hope we celebrate at Christmas. Without God's intervention, we weren't part of the eternal family. Apart from God, we were bound up by our sinful nature and hopelessly headed to the grave. However, because of God's great love for us, he came down and rescued humanity by sending his son, Jesus, as a sacrifice for our sin, so we could be free from the chains of sin and become fully a part of God's glorious eternal family. As we light the first candle of our Advent wreath, The candle representing hope. Let's prepare our hearts to celebrate Jesus' arrival as a gift to all humanity. Let's stir up in our hearts and homes a sense of anticipation. Over this Advent, let's pray and hope would rise, that hope would rise up in our spirits in a tangible and life-giving way. If uh, everyone could stand who's able and join us in singing a Christmas alleluia.
As I mentioned earlier, today is the first Sunday in Advent, and it's also recognized as the beginning of the church year. So please uh, help me out by wishing someone around you a happy new year. I know it doesn't seem right to do that today, but I thought that it was that it's important that we uh, spend a little bit of time getting ourselves into an Advent kind of mood. We're not going to make New Year's resolutions this morning, but we are going to read words of resolution, words of God's resolve to give all the inhabitants of the world hope, found through relationship with Him. As we think about the word hope, what are things that you're hopeful for? I think many of us are hopeful for peace in our hearts, peace in our families or communities, maybe health. Maybe we're, we're hopeful that nations will eventually stop warring against other nations. Or maybe financial pressures to release. Or restoration of a lost relationship. The list could go on and on for the things that we are hopeful for. Children are hopeful this time of year. They write letters to Santa. I know that yesterday uh, Luke, uh, was, we were traveling, he kept saying, I, I keep seeing stuff about Black Friday everywhere. And so a conversation had to ensue about uh, finances and, and companies, you know, not wanting to operate in the red, but operate in the black and how uh, all of that kind of works together. And if I had one pigeon that was worth this much and I sold eight of them for a little bit less, but I could make more money, how that would work in his little mind, he seemed to understand a little bit. Stacy Duke writes in Feasting on the Word, by the time Advent comes around, we have already been primed by our culture for a big event. Catalogs arrive. Anybody get that Amazon catalog? Yeah. <laughs> Catalogs arrive, showing us pictures of happy families in matching pajamas, enjoying a quiet moment together. Commercials splash across the television screen, promising love and contentment in the form of a new gadget. Stores display, uh, store displays evoke nostalgia for childhood wonder. We are invited to lean together toward the coming big event when fantasies will be fulfilled and dreams may yet come true. Advent is the season of awaiting the arrival of Jesus. Before we read these words of Isaiah, think about that first Advent. It wasn't a four weeks until Christmas kind of waiting. It was generation after generation longing for something better, having hope that they'll eventually experience peace and love, joy and blessing in their lives. I have a good friend who uh, previously served for uh, nearly three decades as a minister, and he's gone on to do other things, adding value to the world uh, the good, sharing the good news of Jesus. But his name is Jason English, and um, he wrote a book called uh, the, the Whole Thing. And in this book, he goes through the whole dynamics of the Scripture from the beginning to the end. And he was invited to come and preach along this theme to a, a, a group of summer campers that were middle school and high school students, a few hundred in, in attendance. And by the third day of teaching, he hadn't yet mentioned Jesus. He was going through the Old Testament. He was going through uh, the Torah, the book of the law. He was going through uh, the prophets. And, um, you know, these, these, this group of middle school girls cornered him one day. And they were fired up, he told me. He said, they were so upset. When's Jesus going to come out in your teachings? He said, now you have finally, now you finally have the understanding of those people of God who were waiting for the Messiah. You're waiting for Jesus over a few days to come into my teachings. I'm priming you for the Messiah. We don't know what it's like, though, to be waiting that long for the coming of Jesus. So as we open the book of Isaiah and read these five verses, let's just have a little bit of a, that mindset this morning that they had been waiting and were waiting, and these prophecies were coming, announcing the future coming of Jesus, and we still find ourselves in a bit of waiting. This is what the prophet Isaiah writes, what the Lord gives him to say. This is what Isaiah, son of Amos, saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem. 
In the last days, the mountain of the Lord's temple will be established as the highest of the mountains. It will be exalted above the hills, and all nations will stream to it. Many peoples will come and say, Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the temple of the God of Jacob. He will teach us His ways so that we may walk in His paths. The law will go out from Zion, the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He will judge between the nations and will settle disputes for many people. They will beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation will not take up sword against nation, nor will they train for war any more. Come, descendants of Jacob, let us walk in the light of the Lord. The mountain of hope. The mountain of the Lord. Mount Zion we see referred to several times in the scriptures. Jesus doesn't refer physically uh, to Mount Zion being a place um, for people to pilgrimage to, to only meet with the Lord. Jesus talks about the kingdom of God and it being a spiritual reality that is born in the hearts uh, of born-again believers that is then experienced physically as a kingdom. But as the prophets would announce this place, of course they were using something physical that the people could understand. So you see quite often in in the Old Testament and in the prophecies that that there's this reference to this mountain of the Lord, this Mount Zion, this place where God will reign, uh, where His uh, kingdom and His throne uh, will be uh, forever. And so once again, Jesus doesn't refer physically to this place, but He talks about this kingdom that is coming to earth in the hearts and the minds and the souls of people who have trusted Him for life. So as we think about that this morning, as we think about the mountain of hope that God is in the midst of building and that one day we will experience, the question I have is, what will it be like? What will it look like? What can we put our hope in? Well, I think the first thing to see here in these scriptures is that it's important to know that God will be the only one with the high ground. We just finished a, uh, an election cycle, didn't we? Did anybody get on the YouTube or on just anything and you see this ad after ad after ad of, of politician competing to say, I have the moral high ground. I understand this issue better. I'm better than that person, better than this person. Do you know what they did 10 years ago? You know, I mean, that's kind of how, poly, you know, and then, it, and then it's just, you know, everybody's trying to climb the mountain to have the high ground and then everyone just starts sliding down the mountain What we're told in the scriptures is that there will be a day when God's holy mountain is established and God will be the only one with the high ground. Later in Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 55 verses 8 through 9, we see that God speaks through Isaiah to the people saying, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so my ways are higher than your ways, and my thoughts are higher than your thoughts. It's important for us to sometimes say that it's okay that we don't know everything about everything. We all have opinions, don't we? And, and, and if, you know, the more time we think about our opinions, we, we think, oh, we got a pretty good opinion. You know? I might have spent a little more time than the other person thinking about this issue or whatever. It is, and I'm not talking just about politics, that's just an an example of what we've all experienced in the past few months. It's important for us to remember that that God is the one whose mountain will be higher than any other hill. That even though His ways are higher than our ways, that He does reveal Himself to us, and He can be trusted. Remember, God will be the only one with high ground. Second, God will be and is approachable and eager to help us. You hear that? God is approachable and eager to help us. He says it here in verse 3. Many people will come and say, Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the temple of the God of Jacob. He will teach us His way so that we might walk in His paths. The law will go out from Zion, the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. I had someone speak, and I'm not trying to brag on myself in saying this, but it did make me feel, it made me feel good. One of the things I learned early in ministry is that being a minister 
it's really, impo- it's really important to work on being approachable. That people feel like they can bring anything to you. And so I say it often, pretty much every week. If you have anything that you need to talk about, to know someone's here for you, come and talk to me. And, and a lot of you do that. And um, recently someone said to me, you're, you're just so approachable. And, and, and I respect this person and it meant so much to me. But it took me back to being a youth minister. <laughs> and I remember a, one of the, my supervisors telling me, uh, he said, you know, some of these youth don't think you're approachable. And I said, well, what, what, do you, what do you mean? And so he went through, you know, through this, the, the youth ministry was having a lot of issues. The youth were used to bullying their previous youth minister who basically walked out on them after deciding he wasn't going to deal with it anymore. They didn't feel approachable because I didn't tell them what they wanted to hear. You know, as people get older, we get wiser. We learn that we need to listen to other people. There's going to be a day where we all come to, to, to realize that the Lord is approachable. It might take a lot of effort to climb out from underneath the hill that we've maybe unintentionally buried ourselves under. But when we come to the Lord, trusting the Lord, knowing that, knowing that He's always working for our good, we have to have that mindset or we'll think, the Lord's not approachable. The Lord wants me to walk this righteous path that doesn't look fun. Oh, the Lord's not approachable. But the prophet says, God speaks through him and says that there's going to be this day where people say, come, let us go up to that mountain. Let us climb it. Go to the temple of God. He will teach us his ways so that we might walk in his paths. It's important for us to remember this morning, the Lord is approachable and he's eager to help us. I remind you of scriptures that I remind you quite often of. Uh, 2 Timothy 3, 16 through 17, that says, scripture, All Scripture is God-breathed and useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so that the person of God, the servant of God, may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. And Hebrews 4, 12, For the word of the Lord is alive and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. Thanks be to God that he doesn't just give us what we want, but that he supplies what we need and is eager to help us. The last thing I'll say this morning is just to remind you that there will be a day that evil and violence don't exist. We live in a day where we're scared to go to Walmart or Target or wherever. Go out and be in public, go to a concert No longer is the evil across the sea. It's in our own backyards. And we're reminded this is a constant motif we see over and over in the Old Testament. Verse 4, God will judge between the nations. He'll settle disputes. The people will beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation will not take up sword against nation, nor will they train for war anymore. As we begin this season of waiting for the coming of Jesus, let us remember that there will be the day where Revelation 21, 1 through 5 is revealed among us, where John writes these words, I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away and there was no longer any sea. I saw the Holy One, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look, God's dwelling place is now among the people, and He will dwell with them. They will be His people, and God Himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. John writes, He who was seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. So as we gather this morning, as the body of Christ known as First Baptist Church, Farmville, North Carolina, this family of faith, let us hold on to the hope that is revealed through Jesus.
And let us do that as we now turn our attention toward preparing this house of worship for the advent of our Lord Jesus Christ, who will fulfill the longest yearnings of our heart. Let us pray. God, we thank you so much for this day. We thank you for your presence with us. And Lord, as we enter a new church year, beginning with Advent today, uh, getting this sense of longing for the coming of Jesus, we pray that you would fill our hearts and minds with hope. As we uh, have this very familiar hanging of the green service where we prepare this house of worship for Advent, we pray that you would fill us with that hope. As uh, we think about all of the symbols that surround us during this season and how meaningful that they are. We thank you that while we await hope that your Holy Spirit dwells in us and gives us all the things that we need as we traverse the lives that you've blessed us to live. It's in Jesus' holy name we pray. Amen. I will be reading from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 1, verses 26 through 33. In the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. The angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favored, the Lord is with you. Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. But the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you are to call him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father, David and he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. The kinggom will never end. Poinsettias always add a special glow to the pageantry of the Advent season. This plant blooms at Christmas in Mexico, where it is known by its native name, Flower of the Holy Night. A legendary tale bears out the appropriateness of the native name. A small Mexican boy had no gift to bring to the Christ child's manger bed in the village church. As he trudged toward the church, scuffing his feet in the dust of the road, he decided that he could at least offer the holy infant the branches from a bush that grew beside the road. Quickly, he stripped off some of the branches and made his way to the church where he reverently placed the green leaves at the manger. As he knelt there, the other children jeered and mocked his offering. Rising tearfully, he looked once more at the branches, only to find that a brilliant red star-shaped flower beautifully topped each branch. Today, it is the most popular of Christmas plants, For even without the legend, Christians see in the flaming star of its red bracts, the star of Bethlehem. Evergreens are another special feature of our decor during the Advent season. Like the never-dying evergreen, God's love for us will last forever. The evergreen wreaths are shaped into a circle to signify the never-ending reign of the Messiah. The wreath also signifies the crown, both a sign of the kingship of Jesus and a reminder that because of his love for us, he would eventually wear a crown of thorns. Praise number 245, O Come, O Come, Emmanuel.
I will be reading the prophet Isaiah, chapter 61, verses 1 through 3. The spirit of the sovereign Lord is on me, because the Lord has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for the captives and release from darkness for the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn and provide for those who grieve in Zion, to bestow on them a crown of beauty instead of ashes, the oil of joy instead of mourning, and a garment of praise instead of a spirit of despair. They will be called oaks of righteousness, a planting of the Lord for the display of his splendor. And we cannot hear these words of Isaiah without thinking of the healing that the coming of Christ will bring. The evergreen most associated with healing in the ancient world was the mistletoe, which is one time known as all heal. Today, it is remembered as the plant of peace. Originally, the kiss under the mistletoe was a kiss of peace. For when enemies happened to meet under the mistletoe in the forest, they drew, threw down their arms and exchanged a friendly greeting. It is in keeping with this meaning that we decorate the place of worship with mistletoe in anticipation of the coming of the healing presence of Jesus the Christ. Along with mistletoe, holly and ivy adorn our sanctuary because unlike most plants, they bear their fruit in winter. Holly has become a symbol of Christ's passion, with its prickly leaves representing the crown of thorns, the berries representing the blood he shed for us, and the bitter bark symbolizing the drink he was offered on the cross. Ivy is a symbol of our human weakness, always clinging to the divine strength.
I will be reading from the Gospel of John, chapter 1, verses 1 through 5 and 9 through 14. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him all things are made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. In him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. The true light that gives light to every, everyone was coming into the world. He was in the world, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. He came to that which was, was his own, but his own did not receive him. Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Children born not of natural descent, nor of human decision, or a husband's will, but born of God. The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son, who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. In ancient times, the cedar was known as the tree of royalty. Today, we often use cedar along with other greens, pine, fir, spruce, juniper, and rosemary, which we prize for their fragrance as well as their symbolism of our expectation and hope of the coming of the Christ child again. The chrismons, which are hung on the tree, symbolize this true meaning of Christmas. As we light our tree, may we remember that Christ is ever-present and that he is the tree of life. May the lights on our tree remind us that the Christ child came to earth as the light of the world.
Thank you, children. Y'all did so beautiful. You decorated the tree so beautifully. It uh, looks very festive in here. Be careful who you get under the doorways with, the, with the mistletoe hanging. One of our favorite places to go as a family is to the mountains. And um, I didn't get to go the last time they went uh, this past summer, but hopefully in the spring we'll, we'll make it there again. If you ever take a trip out west to the North Carolina mountains, you know that going you know, through Raleigh and Durham, Chapel Hill, getting out towards Winston-Salem, or if you're dropping down going to Asheville out towards the Charlotte Way, you know that can be a long ride. But you know there's that moment. For us, we like to go to Boone and the Sugar Mountain area a lot, and it happens on 421 after we get past the Winston area. We make that turn. I don't know what exit it is, but we come around the bend, and there we see the mountains in the distance. As we journey Advent, as we journey life together, let's not forget that there will be the day when God reigns on the mountain of hope among his people. That day where Revelation 21, 1 through 5 is fulfilled. And in the midst, as we journey together our lives, and as we journey this season of Advent, I want to read again the last uh, verse that came from our scripture this morning. It says, Come, descendants of Jacob, let us walk in the light of the Lord. Let us never forget that we have brothers and sisters who walk alongside with us, who journey with us, um, if we will allow them to do that or join them or invite them along the way. This coming month is going to be quite busy, isn't it? I don't know about you, but we have something every single weekend, every night of every weekend coming up. But there are many joyous occasions, great opportunities to gather with family, with friends, with church family, to walk in the light together. So as we do so, I, I want to give that encouragement, that invitation to Advent to you. You're not alone. And if you have put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, God dwells in you through the Holy Spirit. He has put His very self in you, and you are never alone. This morning, our uh, hymn of response is called, O Come, Let Us Adore Him, number 196. And as we sing that this morning, let us mean it with every fiber of our being that we are on a journey to go and adore the Lord. If this morning you want to make any decision, there's anything that, that you want to uh, let the church know, if you want to profess faith in Jesus and you've not done that uh, uh, in a corporate worship service before, I'll be here at the front to receive you. Perhaps you've done that but haven't been baptized and would like to be baptized. Maybe you want to become a member of, of the church family here. Perhaps you just want to come forward and pray at the altar. In whatever way you come this morning, I invite you to come as we sing hymn number 196, O Come, Let Us Adore Him. Let us worship.
before we depart this, this house of worship this morning to go and uh, to journey where, where the Lord takes us, I want to say a, a big word of thank you to everyone who has participated in leadership and said yes to uh, speaking and, and doing various things for this service to make it possible. Um, those who brought things down and, and, and hung them, we, uh, we appreciate um, your willingness to to be part of the service. I um, also want to say a word of thanks to those um, on our tech team and, and building and grounds who've done the work. If you haven't, from where you're seated, been able to see the work that's, that's happened in the balcony, um, you could take a trip up the steps if you're able and, and check it out or come down, down front and see it. I, they, they've worked above and beyond um, over the past month or so uh, in doing all that. So thank you to you all, and I hope that you all on uh, that joined us for the live stream had a good experience there with the, the new cameras and, and such. And, and if there's any room for patience, please give it to us. Um, but uh, it's a wonderful season. Um, I, I know we're not technically supposed to say it until, you know, we, we, you know, the Christmas day. But, I mean, you know, but Merry Christmas, okay? Merry Christmas. I love you all. And I hope that this season of Advent is a, is a journey uh, full of hope um, as we uh, journey toward the mountain of hope, the mountain of our Lord. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the hope that you give us. On the darkest day, Lord, when we, when we, feel, uh, when we feel in despair and loss, uh, remind us that there is always hope. Um, that's how the world was before Jesus came. Um, there, were, there were moments of your movement among people and your Holy Spirit ab- among people, but um, the, the Holy Spirit and the kingdom of God came and dwelled in a very different way through Jesus. And we give you thanks and praise and honor and glory. For that, we thank you for the journey ahead. Um, let us remember that we are called to journey in the light with one another as brothers and sisters uh, united in your family. It's in Jesus' holy name we pray. Amen. And may you go in peace. Amen. I didn't help you much today, but I really appreciate it.